Hello everyone, my name is Archana Zadhav. I work as a Beamline support scientist at B24 Beamline. Today I'm going to talk on how to prepare good sample for B24 Beamline in relation with correlative light and X-ray tomography. This is part two of the presentation. Part one presentation has already been recorded by my colleague, Mohammed Quran. Uh, here on the slide, you see lovely people working at B24. Uh, B24 has already been introduced to you in several other presentations. So uh, if you want to know more about B24, please visit Diamond website. Here, I will be briefly talking on two main techniques available at B24, Cryo S60 and Cryo Seam. Then I'll go through the work and then explain how we have spent the last year in lockdown, optimizing the sample preparation process to make it more user-friendly and easily reproducible. I will then show some examples of what can be achieved using correlative microscopies available at B24. We have two high-end microscopes and all conventional accessory tools to prepare samples and map the samples. So, as mentioned earlier, the two high-end microscopes available at B24 are cryostructured illumination microscope and a full-filled cryotransmission X-ray microscope, which cryotransmission X-ray microscope, which produces 3D tomograms of cellular structures. Cryo SXD fills the resolution gap between light microscopy and electron tomography at it has advantage that cells can be imaged whole without staining. So the sample preparation is relatively easier and it preserves cells in its neonative state without artifacts caused by staining or sectioning. Structured illumination microscopy is a type of super resolution microscopy that can be that can double the resolution and b24 this has been combined with cryo stage to hold vitrified samples grown on gold tm grades to enable 3d cryo scene imaging in scene thicker samples can be imaged over 10 micrometers in thickness these techniques also can be used in conjunction with other modalities such as signaling electron tomography and other x-ray imaging modalities these both techniques are great on their own, but when they are used in combination, they can be even significant and give further details about cellular ultrastructure and its function. So here on this slide, you see fully commissioned workflow of B24. Different colors of the boxes shows different stages of the workflow. I'm going to focus mostly on the sample preparation. Sample preparation happens at several temperatures, different temperatures, mostly um, from four degrees to 37 degrees Celsius before vitrification and vitrification takes place at cryogenic temperature, which is minus 196 degrees Celsius. When samples are vitrified, then they go to cryosim first and then cryo And once data is collected, it is used for in silico analysis. So at B24, sample preparation is of paramount importance because good sample preparation is the key to good data. And that's why many members which you see here are involved in sample preparation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the data collection and in silico analysis because it's been covered in part one of the presentation. At B24, we handle at the moment of a sample from, uh, for biosafety level one and two, and it involves a wide range of samples from bacteria, archaebacteria, fungi, algae, uh, to primary uh, cell lines either isolated from insects or um, mouse, rat, or other organisms. And we also use uh, different commercially available mammalian cell lines. So I would finally, again, stress on good sample preparation is the key determining factor for good data. Um, now I'll be taking you through the workflow of sample preparation before imaging. So on this slide, 
you'll see the first save of the sample preparation, which is TM grade preparation. Uh, in B24, we use gold TM grades with carbon coating to enable good cell attachment. So here in this image, you see this flat three millimeter in diameter gold grade and which has the carbon coating. Carbon coating comes in several forms, either as a lacy matrix or the film with the defined holes in it. So the finder grids we use, which is this one, which has two micron diameter holes in it. And this is the grid we use at the B24. These TM grids are hydrophobic in nature. Hence, at B24, we have developed protocols to pre-treat and functionalize grids before sample addition. Samples of meaning the cells can be either seeded on the grids or deposited on the grids after growing somewhere else. So the grid pretreatment to functionalization is important and that can be done either coating grids with fetalpovine serum or by using plasma glow charge or using um, basic amino acids such as polyelysine. And we choose the treatment based on the project and the sample. The next step in the sample preparation is cell culture. So this is uh, when you are growing cells on TM grades for the proliferation treatment before uh, vitrification. So here in this stage, um, Cells are grown at optimum conditions using optimum growth medium and temperatures and other optimum growth conditions. On this slide, you see three different panels. These panels are showing the cell density. Uh, cell density is important for sample health and optimal vitrification. So in middle panel, you see the optimum cell density, which is ideal for good sample, if your cells are low in cell density or high in cell density, they're going to affect the vitrification and data collection. The next step uh, in sample preparation is fluorescent labeling. So here in the slide, you see the beautiful image of a U2OS cells labeled with microtubules and mitochondria, which shows that the uh, fluorescent labels are different cell trackers which might label microtubule, mitochondria, or the organelles like lysosomes and ER, depends on the objectives of the project. So for this step, uh, selection of the cell trackers is based on the project and the objectives of the project. And then the application is based on the optimization of the slides. These fluorescent markers have two important purposes. One, they served as a fiducials for correlation studies. And second, this fluorescent markers also give you more detail about cellular interactions and its ultrastructures. The next step in the sample preparation is fiducial preparation. We sit samples with the means of data collection and correlation. So for that reason, we have produced a decision-making matrix to help user to choose Fiducia for their project for 3D correlation microscopy. So users can make use of this matrix and decide whether the Fiducias are useful for their projects. The next step in the sample preparation is vitrification, uh, sorry, fiducial preparation. So we either use fluorescent or non-fluorescent gold nanoparticles. They vary in size from 150 nanometer to 250 nanometers. We prepare them either by sonication or by BSA treatment. And we vortex them to ensure homogeneous distribution of samples in the coils. Fiducials are useful for the alignment of their series in x ray tomogram reconstruction. So the next stage is vitrification. In this step, we add fiducials, which I discussed earlier. So fiducials are applied on sample grades before plotting. When samples are plotted, then they are vitrified rapidly using cryogenic agents. Plotting time, chamber humidity are optimized based on the cell types and cell density. 
The last step of sample preparation is sample mapping. Sample mapping is required to access B24, which is very crucial and inevitable step for B24, because at this stage, samples are assessed for vitrification quality. We use conventional fluorescent microscope, which is Axio Image N2 linked with CryoSpage. In this step, when samples are assessed for vitrification quality, then fluorescence is acquired from the whole grade and area of interest are mapped for further imaging and cryo-seeing, and then from X-ray microscope. Now, I will take you through our example studies where we have used our protocols, and which shows the power of correlative microscopy available in B24. So on this slide, uh, the results are presented from a recently published paper in CIL, where imaging platform used for understanding the escape of Rio viruses using endocytic vesicles. For this study, we used human u 2 OSRs expressing m cherry galactin 3 So what is galactin 3 Galactin-3 is a protein expressed in human cells, which binds to extracellular carbohydrates and carbohydrates. And this protein is express throughout the cell cytoplasm in normal cells. When cells undergo endocytosis, these external carbohydrates are internalized and made accessible for galactin-3. So hence, the reporter M. cherry galactin-3 is serving as an indicator in the study for endosomal membrane disruption. These due to OS cells were infected with GFP reporter Rio virus and samples were vitrified at four different time points. This slide is a representation of two hours post infection. At this time point, infection induced formation of multivesicular bodies in the infected cell cytoplasm. So, in this slide, you see this uh, slice of a correlated tomogram. As I mentioned, that this is galactin-3 reporter cell line. Galactin-3 is seen in red. The reporter virus used is green. And as we see, this virus is induces multivesicular bodies two hours post-infection. And this co-localization of green virus with the galactin-3 identified the endosomal membrane disruption in infected cells. And this has been only possible because of good sample preparation and the power of correlative light and X-ray tomography. And the next, on this slide, I'm showing you the preliminary results from our influenza project. Here in this project, we used human lung epithelial F549 cells, and these cells are then infected with GFP reporter influenza virus. This GFP reporter is tagged with influenza virus replicases. So on this slide, you see the sections of tomogram from infected F549 cells. Uh, this is the intersection of two cells uh, seen differentiated by this cell membrane. Uh, these infected cells were labeled with depraid mitotracker. Here, the mitochondria in these cells, infected cells seen in red. And the 3D correlation uh, has identified the co localization of influenza virus replicases, replicases with structural islands. So these structural islands are potentially liquid uh, organelles in cell cytoplasm. These liquid organelles are not membrane bound and hence they are low in carbon contrast. As they are low in carbon contrast, they are difficult to discern on their own in just in X-ray tomogram, but they are only become evident after correlation of green influenza virus after correlation. So this is very exciting finding and this has not been shown before in any other research. The only possibility of liquid organelle 
localization with influenza virus has been discussed in recent publication. And what we see here in our study is matches with their discussion. And this is exciting. So now we are doing further research to investigate how this co-localization of influenza virus replicates participates in influenza virus replication process. The last results are from my project. I work on Marix disease virus. I am um, working on Marix disease virus project uh, in primary chicken embryo fibroblast cells. Marix disease virus is the oncogenic member of alpha herpes virus, which causes T cell lymphoma in chickens and other avian species. Here in this project, primary chicken embryo fibroblast were isolated from nine day old chicken embryos and then infected with reporter GFP MDV vaccine strain. The samples were vitrified four days post infection. The reporter vaccine strain here used is just an indicator to see whether the virus is replicating or not. So, here on the slide on the left, you see the fluorescence data. Uh, this is the bright field mosaic of the cells. And then in this panel, you see the fluorescence correlated with the bright field. MTV virus, like other herpes viruses, in, replicates in the uh, nucleus of the host cell. And that's what you see, the virus replication is in the nucleus. And then the tomogram is collected from this section of the infected cells, where you have the section of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now I'm playing you the tomogram, which is a 3D uh, cellular structure of this infected cell. So here you see uh, all the beautiful details of the cells, cellular structures here. So you see the nuclear envelope and you see uh, ER and mitochondria, lipid droplets and other um, cellular organelles and this cytoplasm of infected cell. Here in this infected nucleus, we see capsids of Marxist virus. Uh, like other herpes viruses, Marxist virus also produce three different types of capsids in the nucleus of the infected cells. And these capsids are varying from 120 nanometer to 160 nanometer, depending on the type of the capsid. This is for the first time we have seen Marix disease virus capsids in infected cells, which is exciting. And further research is ongoing to understand um, more about virus replication. And the objective of this project is to find cell to cell transmission of Marix disease virus in in vitro of CF cells. At last, in summary, uh, I I would like to say that B24 had optimized sample preparation protocol. B24 also has published and documented all the procedures. B24 automated the workflow, including remote access and data collection, which is very important in global pandemic. So our user community has definitely got benefited from this. And uh, B24 also has developed and published its own research. Here I have mentioned some recent publications of B24. You can get all the list of publication from our B24 website. In the end, I would like to acknowledge past and present team members, technical support, scientific advisors of Diamond Light Source. Uh, I would like to thank our collaborators from University of Oxford, uh, Professor Irwin, Professor Jonathan, Dr. Angus Van, Dr. Clarissa. And I would like to thank collaborator from the Pobright Institute, Professor Venu and Dr. Yongshu. Special, th uh, special thanks to our wonderful user community and thank you for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at B24Live and thank you again for listening. <laughs>